Hello, Derwin. Hey, John. Montani, Shiver. Hello, Mateo. Hi, everybody. Hi, Mateo. Hi, John. Hi, Marco. Hi, Derwin. Good evening. Hey, Terry. So we have a new participant this evening who um, would uh, express to me that she would like to be an active listener. Uh, her name is Susan McIntosh. And um, Susan, uh, if you would like to introduce yourself, uh, you may uh, by unmuting and turn, unmuting yourself and turning on your video, but you don't have to. Uh, and uh, if you prefer to remain an active listener, that's totally okay. So I'm just leaving a space open in the beginning here as we all check in uh, for you to do what you'd like. Hi, um, I've managed to unmute and turn on the video. Um, I'm an artist, I live in Scotland. Um, I've been following Gibbs there for almost six years since I did my degree. Um, and I encountered Aurobindo through Gibbs there as well. So I'm delighted to be here, it's um, great. I'm glad you could make it. And it's um, very late in the night or early in the morning where you are, right? It's early in the morning. It's one o'clock in the morning here. Well, thank you. We're in Scotland. You're muted, Susan. Yeah, I'm getting the hang of this. Um, I'm in Aberdeenshire in northeast Scotland. Oh, my goodness. I'll be there in a couple of months. Yeah. I'll be near Old oh, Castle. Fantastic. Near Old Castle Slains. Oh, that's just on the coast. That's not far away. Mm -hmm. um, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so let's give it a couple of minutes for other folks to, to join us. Um, I did put out a uh, um, post or posted a, a call for um, volunteers to lead this meeting, but nobody did. Uh, nobody um, volunteered. And so I could ramble. <laughs> um, and it may go somewhere interesting or it may evoke something. Um, but I would prefer that was the second option. Uh, and there are certainly some things I would like to articulate. Um, I'm just not sure I, I want to... Uh, volunteer myself uh, without leaving some space for, for uh, others to, to do so. Can we volunteer you? Can. Can. We, I volunteer Marco. Okay. Uh, well, I would like then to just say a couple of things before we meditate and then allow for that meditation period to let that kind of clear, diffuse a, a, a little bit, and then see what arises after that. Um, so it's been occurring to me, and this is fairly obvious, uh, that uh, it's almost impossible to give the text the level of attention to detail that I think it requires to really grok the conception that Aurobindo is presenting. Even, I'm just speaking at the mental level. Uh, and I'm not sure that I want to do that personally uh, at this time, but I, I see that, it, um, that, that, that there's a lot that we're glossing over in our, in our conversations or at, certainly in my own uh, thinking about about the text and about this whole experience, this this um, this reading, and so I think though that part of what that allows that kind of distance 
from the granularity of the argument and the conception is it allows perhaps attention to other aspects of uh, what the text is doing or what we're doing with the text. And I think that's been ex expressed uh, in various locations as a kind of field effect or a field reading or a field phenomena. Uh, this reading is occurring in this, this distributed way in space and time or in different places in the world, different times, different, as Gebser would say, temporics. And, um, and at the same time, it's occurring on this infinite conversations platform where we're also doing other kinds of work uh, and engaging other texts and other kinds of activities. Uh, so there's a, there's a field of activities going on. There are different things going on, which are, um, I think, influencing each other in this sort of maybe play of force uh, between them. And I have found it um, an, an, a challenge, a, an interesting challenge, uh, I'll say, to uh, track it all, to keep up with it all, uh, to follow you know, the, the, the threads, the, the suggestions, the, the, the poetry, um, the ideas to their... Um, to their kind of implicit destinations and all the different directions that, that they could go. So I'm looking for a way to modulate my relationship to this, uh, this experience in, a, a, in order to kind of gain the clarity that I can uh, in the flux of my life as it is uh, and in this dynamic field of relationships that we're in. And um, that's a part of the living inquiry for me uh, of what we're doing. And although, well, uh, um, uh, although we may not achieve a kind of scholarly um, type of comprehension of the text on a chapter by chapter, argument by argument basis, I would like to explore what um, what else might emerge from the field of our interactions, and I think that something is emerging, and um, I I think that th these calls can be an opportunity to give those emergents the space they need to work themselves out, to know themselves, uh, and to um, perhaps come to greater coherence or clarity, not for anyone in particular or for maybe us all in different ways. Uh, and so I would like to invite that to occur uh, in the time that we have uh, together uh, now. And I think I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that as far as comments. Uh, I have a whole page full of other things I could say, but I think those might be coming more from a, a mental perspective. And I'm interested in what's beyond the mental without leaving the mental behind, uh, engaging it and um, perhaps enacting what Aurobindo is uh, writing about in his his vision that the mental could be an expression of the supermental, the truth consciousness, or the supermind. So, um, shall we meditate?
Are we, are you hearing me? Okay. Hi. Um, I just want to let Susan know I'm, I'm pretty much a newbie also. I'm, this is my third Zoom session. So as a newbie, I wanted to make a very, well, somewhat humble response to one of Marco's points. Um, yeah trying to cover over a thousand pages in six months is, is pretty daunting. And just a suggestion, I, I know you have it set up, just something to, to think about. Um, Sri Aurobindo wrote the first version of The Life Divine in around the time of World War I. And it, almost 25 years later, he revised the whole thing, but he wrote the last six chapters from scratch. And from a lot of people that I trust who I think understand his teaching and his yoga much better than I do, they say that you can almost read the six last six chapters of a self-contained book. And it's pretty amazing because the first of the last six chapters, um, Man's Spiritual Evolution, really gives his entire evolutionary view. And it's pretty cool because he has these instances where for pages he argues against himself. So you can really see and he's doing it really sincerely. Like, if I'm going to argue as fiercely as I can against what I've, everything I've written, here you go. The next chapter, the triple transformation, is like the whole yoga. The entire practice, the essence of it, is right in that chapter. The next two chapters, I think, are among, maybe among the hardest. I think it's the next two. I'm, I'm missing one, but I think it's there. The ascent to the supermind and the, and the Gnostic being. He's just like saying, okay, I'm going to stop coddling you. I'm going to just write the supermental, supermental language. You sort of, sort of accept, like, I have no idea. I've been reading this for 40 years. I have no idea what he's saying. Kind of go through that. The last chapter, I think, Marco especially, the last chapter, personally speaking, is the best thing for me I've ever read anywhere on a spiritual view of what a society could look like, a, a divine society. It's a really, really concrete and he has a fierceness about what's happening now. That this is this is a Kurukshetra of, of the world right now. And we're going through these, this battle, these extraordinary forces, and he's saying, this is the only way. Not not that my way is the only way, but someone somewhere is going to figure out around the world. He talks about you know, something that's very present here in Asheville. I see it a lot. There's probably at least 40 groups around Asheville in North Carolina, I'm in North Carolina in the south, southeastern United States that are experimenting with, with um, eco-groups and spiritual communities and agri-communities. Agri, um, and he talks about these small, independent communities tied together around the world. Anyway, just a suggestion. I wanted to share where I'm at with the reading, kind of on Marco's, uh, like, where where are we? Where are we now? I wasn't able this week to even touch the text. So I, uh, I, I had been having double passes through the first two sections and then a single pass through the third section. And this section, my life has been um, uh, just a, lo a lot of things have been pulling my attention this week. So no time to read. 
uh, last winter solstice, the winter solstice before last, I had a group of 12 in my fire room right here. And we uh, had hour and a half sessions of reading uh, through until we finished a, a braided reading of the last chapter of the life divine, the divine life. And so each paragraph got read twice and we, everyone read two paragraphs and we went around in a circle for hours and had soup in between. And, um, uh, the, even even the mother sent set out her last uh, sections of questions and answers were an attempt to deconstruct the last six chapters of the life divine. Um, it's the 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 mental. Di- I have to say, I have to sh- I have to share. I love the mental. However, approaching this with mental discourse is really hard for me uh, because. Uh, People say something and then one point is taken and things are missed and fragmented. You know, it's the very nature of mind and the very nature of discourse. And for, uh, for me, this is a yoga and it's really, uh, it's difficult for me to approach critically. And I also don't have the philosophical background and experience that you all have. I'm really looking for practical tools. So, um, I'm interested in exploring that and I'm interested in there's things that I'm there's in, in attempting to pace at this rate, there's things that I'm seeing that I haven't seen before. So there's something um, for me, there's something, even though I wasn't able to touch it this week, there's something very valuable in the process and even the aspiration. And I know all my weeks won't be like this week. I'll probably get back to a pace of double passes And I only read one chapter at a time before I break. Some people have different rhythms with this. Yeah. The life divine is, is, it's, it's interesting. I, I just, uh, I, I'm curious how the, the, the forum has been too overwhelming for me to even touch. I've seen my uh, name reference and my dear, lovely friend, Heather Fester. Like I can't touch those questions that, that she asked about um, process of, I can, I can give references, plenty of references, but it's not my, um, it's not my position to engage in mental discourse that way. We could look at the essays on the Gita, two chapters called the, I don't know, the process of avatarhood and the something, the, the possibility in the way of avatarhood. I don't know. There's a couple of chapters in, essays on the Gita, but as far as, and as far as speaking for, there was one, someone that kind of asked to speak to what disciples of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, how they view this and that. I, I can't, um, I can't speak for anyone at all. I can't speak for the community, the global community, even though I'm intimately linked in, there's always these processes of Swabhava and Swadharma and Swarupa. Each one of us have our own essential self of being. Each one of us have our own essential work in the world and our own form from which we do that. We're entirely unique in the oneness in that way. Yeah, so I, I wonder what is the possible, what is the, I love, love that question, Marco. What is the, what is the possibility here to approach this without leaving the mind behind? And, um, and uh, yeah, why, why have we come together? I, I personally like going exploring. Um, I, I might be a traveler myself, but here we are, and we're all seated. <laughs> we won't be traveling, nor will we be reading more than maybe a few quotes at a time or passages from memory. So it's a good, good question. Like what else can emerge as Zoom explorers. I just wanted to share briefly since Aurobindo um, 
is an interesting spiritual figure because he had that political side that was so strong in his life, at least at one point, it was a little earlier. So last week, exactly the time of this meeting, um, I had the opportunity to speak with an Australian man named Adam Jacoby, uh, who's very involved in the direct democracy movement. Um, Worldwide, he's at, uh, you know, he went to Davos. <laughs> um, he's won a world top 50 innovator award. Um, he's, he's kind of a force of nature, really. Uh, and um, so he'll be, he's in the States now, and he'll be um, facilitating a, a dialogue on gun control in conjunction with CNN and all the young folks of the Never Again movement uh, next month and using this platform that they developed with smartphones and the blockchain to hopefully orchestrate a vote on this topic. Um, so that was pretty cool. And then in August, he's training with his team 200 candidates in India <laughs> um, to, to use the di direct democracy approach. They've already got a million people signed up over there. I know it's a huge country, but still a million people. Um, so it's just an interesting kind of echo because Aurobindo definitely had that freedom fighting element at one point. Um, and so at least it was personally meaningful to be talking to this guy last week at exactly the time that you were all meeting. <laughs> And so I wanted to share that. I'd like to echo a point that Matteo made, uh, with res but from a different angle. Uh, you, you spoke of whom or what you could speak on behalf of. You don't speak for the Aurobindo community or something like that. And I think that it's interesting that we have this um, convergence of multiple streams uh, di from different communities, different intellectual and spiritual uh, traditions and one of those we've mentioned is Ken Wilber, Gene Gebser has been mentioned, Rudolf Steiner various others uh, there's also the concept of integral theory as a organizing framework for a worldview or view of reality uh, that um, ostensibly is coming from or is about an integral whole reality. I don't necessarily want to get into all the you know, details of the comparative philosophy and, you know, who, who, who exactly, uh, maybe I do want to get into them, but, but the, that's not the thrust of what I want to say. Um, I, 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 I think I just want to observe that I think that that's present, but I personally don't feel like I can speak for integral theory. I think that if we were going to go into that concept, we'd have to really break it down into some very specifics around the formation of that concept, through whom, through which books, how did the ideas evolve, what were the various influences. I mean, it's a real, it's a real I think, project. And some people have worked on that. Uh, Jennifer Gidley is one whom we read um, previously. 
and who um, I think does a very gracious, uh, generous uh, job in giving each thinker and their ideas a, a, a space to coexist and to um, reflect on each other and learn from each other. And I, I, appreciate, I appreciate that approach. And that was commented on, uh, I think, by more than one of us who participated in, in that talk. Can I interrupt for just a minute? My company from Colorado just showed up, so I have to leave. But thank you so much anyway, and I'll be, I'll be back next week. Okay. Thank, thank you. Very. All right. Bye-bye. Um, case in point, in a way, because integral, what we might refer to as integral theory, could have its version articulated by Ken Wilber, specifically through his books, and those have a particular evolution. Um, Terry has her own, I think, conception of integral theory, and others have theirs. Uh, and so certainly one of the difficulties of the discursive format is teasing all of that apart and really tracing our ideas back to where they came from and what they're actually even about, because they may not even be about the ideas. They, they may be pointing to or opening to something else. Uh, so I think part, perhaps what I'm attempting to say is that uh, maybe express a certain caution around um, identifying ideas with, with, um, with particular voices or, you know, even, um, certainly with, you know, this as a platform or as a, as a project, uh, I, I've, tr I've tried to be pretty conscientious about how I, um, articulate things because I, I don't want to fall into an identification that becomes reified. Uh, I think that there's um, a living quality that is deeper and more important than the ideological uh, formation of a um, of a group or of a endeavor, uh, and also the very idea of an endeavor. Like, what what are we doing? Why are we here? Like, what that that's not just about the plat. It's not just about the platform. It's it's it has many dimensions and different meanings to it. And um, I f find myself more and more appreciating the multidimensionality of that, even though it really messes with my mind. <laughs> and um, it, uh, it's becoming catalytic, I'll say. I think part of my experience, my, my first person I experience in reading this text, it's part of a, a movement for me that is creative and that is relational and that is um, cosmic in my, for me, right, as, a, as an individual. And what I think Aurobindo is doing, or part of what this text is doing, or the experience of reading the text in this particular way, is that it's catalyzing that process and it's mediating it. And I, I'm, I'm one thing at an intellectual level that I notice and appreciate is how Aurobindo has included these mediating entities or structures. So the supermind is there to mediate between the mind and the absolute. At a, just at an intellectual level, I can appreciate that. And also appreciate the need for it. And um, so uh, uh, one particular, this is more on a personal note, um, interest of mine is the singularity idea. And that's for artistic reasons. And I'm working on a poem that uh, plays with uh, that motif. Uh, and so I've mentioned in previous talks how um, I think one way of reading or experiencing Aurobindo is that he's trying to maybe channel us or direct us toward um, some singularity type 
he doesn't use that term. That's, you know, what, what another kind of discourse brings to it, but some kind of singularity type experience or transformation. Uh, I think that relates to this discussion on stages of development and levels and planes or grades. I mean, that's all kind of part of the, the jumble of language that, that we've been using, not just jumble. It's, it's actually had a lot of coherence, but it takes a lot to, par to parse it. And um, when I write and when it comes together, it's not just happening in me. And so it, this, this, um, this question, I think, of wh why we're coming together, I, I think it has something to do with that um, motive, that desire, um, that movement. Uh, and I, I think that um, what's been useful for me coming out of the integral world and integral theory world is, is to create some space around the concepts because I don't think I know exactly what is going on. Uh, and something in me does know, <laughs> though. I know that something in me knows, but, but I'm not there exactly yet. Or maybe I, I don't know. See, I get trapped up in my mind. Anyway, I think that's what I wanted to say. So I thought I might dance off of um, Marco's comment about the singularity. This is, this is fun. I love this one. So I think it's kind of cool. I talk to people about it a lot. It's sort of a fun little dance. Um, so Alan Wallace, who's a Tibetan Buddhist teacher and very close to Robert Thurman, who's the chair of Tibetan St Buddhist studies at Columbia University, suggests that just as the Renaissance the European Renaissance was sparked by the revival of Greek philosophy and literature, that we're in the midst of a 500 year shift to a global Renaissance because of the meaning of Asian contemplative wisdom. And Rianne Eisler and David Corton suggest that what we're seeing now with Trump and Bush and maybe even a Clinton and Obama, it's kind of the death of the age of empire. And we're in the midst of a, 5,000 year phase, something new. And I think in some ways you could say, Sri Aurobindo is saying that, you know, Homo sapiens is maybe uh, 250,000 years old, but the, the shift towards human beings started about 5 million years ago. So we may be on the cusp of a 5 million year phase towards a new species, and that would be the kind of the ultimate singularity. And this is sort of one, I think, neat way of looking at. It's a little quiet. We have a couple of people waiting, and maybe we could bring them in. They've been here before, Kim and Frederick, Fred Dolan. Hey, Kim. Hi, Fred.
We're tuning into the field. Uh, maybe I could just say something very briefly about field effect. Um, and there's been some interest, like Marco, you were saying catalytic, and there's been some interesting catalytic things happen. Um, part of my participation on the platform has felt like trying to integrate some things uh, from childhood, <clears throat> my father's a poet and writer type person, and and I grew up in a spiritual community, and there was a number of things I felt like not quite integrated about all that. And uh, there's been this process happening uh, with Heather. Um, I reached out to Heather because I read a little bit more and saw she was an English professor, and I had written this article about Blake's philosophy of spirituality in the second year of undergrad. Um, and I was quite proud of it at the time. I got good feedback from the professor. She said part of that could maybe be published. And, and then I had lost it somewhere. <laughs> and I really wanted to find this um, thing that I had written when I was like 19. And so I just reached out to Heather and said, Heather, I'm, I'm trying to look for this Blake. I see you're an English prof. I'm trying to look for this Blake paper. And, uh, you know, could you just hold, help me hold the vision that I find this thing? And so, sure enough, like, I just <laughs> found it. <laughs> uh, and then uh, it just felt really good. And now I've shared it with my dad, who's always loved Blake. He's from England. Uh, and he got an email from him today. So oh, I'm just loving reading this, you know, Derwin. And so it's just been really a nice um a nice uh, process and uh, so Heather's not here but a thank you to Heather for uh, for uh, holding the line there with me so I could uh, do that recovery work I'm just going to check on Fred because he seems to be in this kind of indeterminate place. Fred, can you hear us? Are you here? I'm going to try to unmute you. Yes, Kim, could you ask him to like log out and then come back in? And I'll, I'll let him in as soon as he gets back. That's really cool, Darwin, by the way. <laughs> Don, I just want to say, uh, 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 of course, I haven't read it, but I really like that vision of small communities interconnected in this planetary sort of meshwork. I, th I think that part of what Derwin is um, tuned into a bit, too, um, that in the technology and in some of the political work that's being done is a similar decentralized uh, kind of conception, uh, something anarchic about it, but that word is kind of problematic um but really that's you've mentioned that aurobindo was a kind of anarchic uh philosopher uh and i think that that's actually happening in the tech world uh and in some of the the thinking around how we can reorganize uh the arrangements uh on on the planet yeah J um. J Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just, um, I suppose, 
not commenting particularly on Aurobindo, um, but more an observation on following what Marco was saying, that having read Gebster with the group um, not keeping up very quickly, um, again, that this 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 what we're doing here it has a different feel to it. There is um, a different quality to what's happening within this group and the platform as to what happened with Gebster. Now, I don't know why that is. Is it something to do with the context of the text or the, 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 the um, particular individuals in the group um, or what? But I don't know. But just offering that as an observation, really. Sparked my curiosity, a couple of questions. Have you watched the other videos? And then what are you observing as the differences? Um, I haven't watched the last video. Um, I've watched the other ones. Um, what's the difference? There, there is more of um, uh, what? Gebsner had more of um, um, an, um, um, a discussion of what's going on within the text, I think. Whereas here, there's um, there's a sense of a tangential um, something going on in a kind of spiritual fashion, or or something that there's a, another dimension to this, to rather than the slightly more um, maybe academic view that was employed with the Gebsner reading. Uh, does that? I really don't know what it is myself, and I'm trying to get a handle on it and have been doing so. Um, does that make any sense to anyone? Oh, hi. Here we go. So we let, uh, yeah. We've also talked about a quantum field. Sometimes it seems like we're like popping into existence here as folks show up. So I think that's one of the little funny ways that it shows up as well. Hi, Fred. Hello. Hi. Thank you for letting me in. I guess I'll... Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead what I was going to say. Hi, Fred. Nice to meet you. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Don. Um, let's see. I'm going to try and integrate... Um, communities and the text. So the chapter that I loved this week was The Double Soul. And I was thinking, Jan and I met, well, we became friends on August 15th, 1993, at a meeting at one of the Sri Aurobindo communities, Matagiri, Mother's Land, in New York. Um, in 2006, we started studying with Roy Eugene Davis, who was a direct disciple of Yogananda. And not that we were looking for a teacher, but we wanted to be, he's about two hours away in Georgia and beautiful mountains. And we just wanted to be with a, there's, there's not much of a functioning Sherbino community around here. So we wanted a community and we liked him. And I, I didn't know, I've known Yogananda for decades, but I didn't know that he very, very much advocated this idea of small communities linking up around the world. Um, we, Jan was a few blocks away working when the towers were hit. We left about two months later, New York City, and ended up in an eco-community modeled after Sarvadaya in Sri Lanka and Oroville, only it was in northwestern South Carolina, um, which is the buckle of the buckle of the Bible Belt. We, we were, in, we were in, in that mode where, you know, every few weeks you'd hear, like, Obama's the Antichrist, and be that moment like, okay, next flight back to New York, you know. Um, our favorite moment was, Jan, I'm sorry, I've told this a million times, but I'm still not over the shock. You're in the supermarket, and the lady ne next to you says to a customer, oh, are you Jewish? We love you people. We're studying you in class. And they love the Jews because when the Jews go back to Jerusalem, they all get slaughtered, and everyone dies and it burns in hell, and the Christians take over the world. So we lived there for eight years. And we kept eyeing Asheville for, for years and got a chance to move here. 
and uh, every other person you meet on the street is talking about eco communities and Gebser and Fiorbindo and Ken Wilber, and it's a very crazy place. Asheville's weird. But the last point, oh, singularity. There's a there's gotten to be more of a sense here. It's very alive here. The sense that I mean, there's a there's an LGBTQIXDWYZ bookstore, Firestone bookstore, which makes me feel like I'm back in the East Village over in West Asheville. And you go there and like there is such a live sense. It's like you can feel the force there. Like you have the sense like people in here know something's happening. It's extraordinary. And people are I'm constantly meeting people talking about. What are we doing? Oh, here's the final point. So I remember back in New York talking about eco-communities, and there's another movement, which I, maybe, Markle, you know about, that do we need to go to a separate community and build an agri-community, eco-community, whatever, or can we create communities, you know? I remember Avenue D in New York City 40 years ago, they built a windmill on top of their building that generated so much energy, Con Edison paid them every month for the energy. You know, could we do that? Uh, Jan and I talk a lot with people here in Asheville. Building community. We're in a black neighborhood in, in Asheville. We've been to the Community Association. We keep thinking of ideas. Uh, another woman here in Asheville is part of the Transition Asheville group. She went to Israel and taught nonviolent communication to Israelis and Palestinians. What can we do in our own neighborhoods to foster that movement towards the singularity? Hey, Marco. Um, I, when I hear singularity, I think of uh, my undergraduate and graduate program, and uh, I wrote a terrible um, criticism of, uh, I forget the guy's name that wrote that book, but <laughs> Rick Kurzweil, I think. Um, I, I didn't particularly care for him that much, actually, <laughs> um, for a lot of reasons, which I've already forgotten, but they're in my paper somewhere. Um, so when you say singularity, Don, I'm just curious. Do you mean like in the way that Ray Kurzweil talks about it or in another way? Okay, good. <laughs> You're on mute. I can't hear you, Don. Yeah, I'm riffing off Marco. No, no I, don't, I don't like. I love the Kurzweil keyboard, but not Ray. Okay. Marco, I'm, I'm curious. Because I, I know you brought up Kurzweil in the past. Um, what, it, what the reference is there to him as it pertains to Aurobindo and the reading? Well, specifically, like the, the conceptual reference is that in Kurzweil's vision, after you know, computers become fast enough and complex enough that they can uh, essentially re-engineer themselves faster than we can keep up with them, that they will... Um, now he does. He he sees this as a partnership. So I don't want to paint him as kind of like the techno you know, utop utopian devil. He sees humanity being uh, in partnership, sort of cyber cybernetic kind of partnership. But what he believes this super intelligence post singularity will ultimately do is turn the entire universe, literally the entire universe. I mean, all the atoms in the universe into um, uh, aspects of itself, like little computers that are all linked together in its own super mind, if you will. Uh, so at that extreme, there's, I think, a convergence with Aurobindo. And I, again, that's just the sort of intellectual, conceptual connection to it. But I think that there's also, in this almost bizarro way, like this shadow bizarro way, that deep metaphysical drive like it's like the other side of the same coin to me uh and i'm attempting in a way that integrates my personal subjectivity to fuse those all into like this one utterance <laughs> so that's what singularity means to me uh, and it's wild. Like I've actually like, completed the first part of this three-part poem this week, but it's 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 occurring, and I think it's like requiring 
in a way, this field effect. And so that that's why it's been so catalytic and why I'm, I keep kind of bringing it up. Thank you, Marga. When I think when I hear, when I think of Ray Kurzweil and I think of like sort of like technology sort of taking off in a direction, I think of like an episode of Black Mirror or something. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen that that show, but uh, um, it's uh, yeah. Anyways, that's what I think of when you <laughs> when you describe that. I'm not sure I like that. It's weird. It's like ultra weird, super weird. This is like super weird stuff. It may be more like Sensei than Black Mirror. I think. <laughs> I vote more for Sensei than Black Mirror. <laughs> Susan, I was really appreciating what you were saying about the difference between uh, the felt difference between this group um, and the uh, the Gebser group because I was um, involved in that, and I like Mateo your challenge to kind of like get specific around what the differences might be or how we would describe those um, for those of us that participated in both of them. And I, I'm struggling myself to sort of um, make a comparison because um, I feel like I'm in such a different place than I was when I read the Gepster work. I felt like Gepster's reading was very integrative for me and very challenging. I feel like it had, the thing that, that I think Gepster had for me that's at least so far Orbindo does it is this idea of sort of like, I felt like I was like, um, uh, on a timeline and kind of like going back in time and sort of like moving forward in these different like fields of study or ways that he was sort of showing this sort of, um, sort of evolution or uh, that's not the word I would use, but like these intensifications and different fields of study. And so I felt like, um, in that sense, it was very integrative for me across like time to look at sort of what I understood as history and how I made sense of my own place in that way that I understand, you know, where I exist in time right now. And uh, um, he just gave me a completely different way of kind of like rethinking, like everything I'd ever studied or been introduced to since childhood. And with Aurobindo, I feel like I'm just sort of surfing in his uh, wave of sort of ideas or the way that he describes his experience and the way that he sort of like tries to build this very sort of um, intimate uh, way of sharing how he experiences the world, but it's also like so heavily referencing this, these other sort of more esoteric or ancient sort of um, bodies of work that I don't have as much personal experience or knowledge with them. So I feel like I'm really learning something for the first time in the language um, as I'm reading it. So it's just, for me, it's just so different culturally um, as a reference point. So I feel like I'm really slow to kind of catch on to um the, this particular reading, but I feel like I kind of get it after I get enough reference points and then I kind of stumble again because I feel like I'm relearning. So that's the difference between, I mean, one way of describing the differences for me between the two. Listening to you just now, I think that perhaps part of the differences between Gebsner and Aurobindo, many differences obviously, but that with Aurobindo, Although with Gebsner, there is um, obviously a huge spiritual dimension, but he isn't, um, he isn't involved with that. He doesn't, he acknowledges it. But with Aurobindo, it's so much part of his culture and the, the, the kind of spiritual aspect there, the kind of intuitive, the intuition he talks about is so much more apparent it's more it's more live within the text and maybe that's contributing to this other feeling um with it this extra dimension that this group has that Gebsner didn't have um perhaps so susan i i wanted to i for, i'd meant to say this before i mentioned the text before i i didn't say it i wanted to play off something you're saying so my favorite chapter of the chapters we're reading now is the double soul and man. And the, 
what I get, what came to me as, you, as Susan, as you were trying to describe this quality, and it's an interesting dance during the week of what happens, Ed brought it up, sort of engaging and not engaging with it, going back and forth with the text and something else is emerging. I, I want to thank Johnny. Johnny kind of keeps, in, I feel like, inspires us to keep going beyond getting fixed in any place. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, so my sense is that if I'm too stuck on the text or the words or my ideas, I'm in, I'm not actually crazy about his term, but calls it the desire. So the surface personality. And he describes something which is not that esoteric that, that my sense is everyone, I used to work with profoundly, the, ter, the, the official term back then 20 years ago was profoundly and um, severely mentally retarded. It's now disabled, but people with IQs that had them, uh, you know, equal to about a one or two year old child functioning. And I remember we had music and dance on, I would bring my keyboard and we have music and dance on Fridays. And, you know, the soul comes through, what he calls the psychic being. It's a, it's a taste, it's a touch. So I, I wanted to read this passage. It's, I'm sure Matteo has probably seen this a million times. It's one of the most quoted passages from Sri um, I, I I've read it for 40 years, and I still find it has as much power every time. The true soul, secret in us, is not situated below the threshold of the waking mind, but rather burns in the temple of the inmost heart behind the thick screen of an ignorant mind, an ignorant mind, life and body, not subliminal, but behind the veil. This veiled entity is the flame of the Godhead, always alight within us, inextinguishable even by that dense unconsciousness of any spiritual self, which obscures our outward nature. It is a flame born out of the divine and luminous inhabitant of the ignorance grows in it till it is able to turn it towards the knowledge. Just a little bit more. It is the concealed witness and control, the hidden guide, the daemon of Socrates, the inner light or inner voice of the mystic. It is that which endures and is imperishable in us from birth to birth, untouched by death, decay, or corruption, an indestructible spark of the divine. One thing that Sri Aurobindo comments on over and over again is that the change of consciousness that puts us in collaboration with the psychic being, the the soul in the passage that Don just read, 
can't come from outer means. There's, I mean, outer, outer means are part of matter and substance. But there's some inner, inner shift that needs to happen. I don't, I don't know what it is. I've been trying, trying to get at this for a couple of decades now. And I don't think I'm anywhere closer than anyone in this circle. But he, but Sri Aurobindo was, it seems to me, was definitely there. And it's one thing that made, to, to, to me anyway, it's one thing that makes them so special in the manifestation on the earth is that they were there and became channels for higher consciousness to come through. And, uh, and the way in which they talk about us participating in that is being in community, not rejecting matter and, and uh, attempting to bridge all the parts of our being to that soul and have that soul be operating on planet ashram everywhere and uh, be in contact with other souls that are also in contact with the transcendent divine so that nature is just kind of like this this aid toggling between those two poles yeah and it's a it's it's in the triple transformation but it's also all over the 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 letters that Sri Aurobindo wrote to to Sadak's uh, letter, volume three of uh, letters on yoga, probably a thousand, probably five hundred pages is dedicated to how do we how do we collaborate in contacting our soul? How do we collaborate with? How do we collaborate in the spiritual transformation? So how how do we become open channels and and um, my my mind has my mind and outer distractions and and uh, kind of energy it seems like there's a lot of energies countering that constantly I'm just barraged by things by 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 forces that that don't want that to happen and and I really struggle with that personally. It's, it's just like all the, all the, the things that pull my attention, um, out from, from like being, from being inside and aspiring to operate inside and go from there outward rather than having, um, my, my mind, um, my impulsive ideas kind of can control, outcomes and groups, working groups, every, everything, you, you name it. It's, uh, it's extremely difficult work to do. And it's like at the, at the base of my yogic aspiration in this life on this planet. How, how, do we, how, do I, how do I contact that soul and work with everyone that's in my field from there? It's, uh, this is the, the deepest question that I, I, I don't feel like I'm anywhere close to, but I'm still... I'm still going to uh, aspire for that. When I was uh, studying to be an actor, I remember one of the first acting classes I took when I was a teenager. You stood on the stage and you put yourself inside of a circle of attention and you were only aware of what was in that circle. So it was a circle with just yourself in it. So you tuned into that and then you expanded the circle so that it include, included the whole stage and whoever else was on the stage with you. And you, you tuned into that that larger circle, while staying in contact with the, the previous circle. And then you expanded that circle to include the whole auditorium and everyone in that auditorium. 
And so one of the, and as a young person, I sort of, I, I sensed it intuitively that there was a great value in that as a performer to aid you in concentration and being able to focus your attention appropriately. Sometimes the character is very self-reflexive, maybe a, a soliloquy or something like that, where he, he or she is talking to herself, internally processing something. Other times you're addressing everyone on stage. And always, whether it's an internal state or some a love scene you're doing or you're having a sword fight or you're giving a big speech to other participants, you're always attentive to the person up in the gallery, way up there, so that you know that you can intend to include them. So, and I know in the theater when I saw some great actors, it was wonderful how you could be up in the, the back row up in the gallery and they could be doing something exquisitely intimate and they could be whispering something very intimate to another performer and you could hear every word just as if they were sitting right next to you. And it's almost as if great performers can get the whole audience to breathe at the same time. It's, it's a quite amazing, amazing when you see the presence of someone like that. Great actors and great musicians. Um, anyway, here we are in front of our computers looking into these flat screens, these little square boxes with faces and a, and a name attached. And we can hear the voices. I can hear the voices coming in through the speakers. And I'm just, I'm just curious about the world that we're creating. Um, with, with this technology and the wonders of it. Um, I mean, for me, I was, uh, I read a bit of the text. Uh, I especially loved the one on death, death and desire. And I switched over to uh, Savitri. Um, there was someone on, on YouTube who was reciting a passage, a couple of passages from Savitri and it just, and it was about, um, Savitri is, is mourning the loss of someone. And then I thought, well, I think I'll just turn on, I just wanted to hear Strauss, the death and transfiguration. So I listened to this, uh, a couple of beautiful passages about the character in this tone poem and this, in this music is, is, is facing death. And, um, and I felt that was uh, just a way for me to, and then it was a very beautiful day. There'd been a storm. So I was watching the tree outside, very green, wet leaves, sun. So I just, um, just feel that this is, um, uh, was a very good way of approaching the text um, for me today. I might do it something, something very differently. Uh, but I think there was something about listening to the text, listening to the the Savitri, listening to some music that sort of shared a motif or a theme and getting up and, and moving around to the music. So, so thank you. I think maybe a difference between Gipser and Arobindo, which I haven't read Gipser, but is that Arobindo is able to give us a vision that each atom or, or beyond the atom has, can, can do the same thing that the actor does and the atom will focus on itself and then expand out and it has its own consciousness. It has its own, um, the, these last chapters we read for me, Aurobindo is developing his cosmology. It's, it's the, he's catalyzing cosmic community. Um, and 
while we're sitting here trying to figure out how to catalyze some sort of Zoom community or our local community. And that for me, that's a grand difference there. Um, and it's not something I'll ever be able to fathom in my lifetime. But, but to, to even attempt to imagine such a consciousness um, puts us as little, little folks in, into perspective. It makes us focus on what's important. So it's, it's a lot to think about, a lot to cover here. <laughs> I think that's why we can't talk about the text very well, but I think I like the conversation right now. Um, if it's not out of order, could I go back to a point that uh, Don made earlier um, in the passage uh, that you read? Um, uh, there was a mention of Socrates Daimon. Um, I think it was part of a series of uh, figures that Arbindo was offering for you know, as ways of sort of describing or pointing to this super mind <clears throat> or the sort of abiding consciousness of reality. It just struck me because when I think of the daimon Socrates, as he describes it, uh, you know, it's always telling him what not to do. It never tells him what to do, but when he feels himself about to do something, um, this little voice tells him not to. And uh, I've always liked, I like that, that a lot because it seems to me that it corresponds to an intuition that I think most of us have about morality and ethics, and that is that um, it's much easier to get agreement on what's wrong than on what's right. It's, uh, it's easier to, to feel that we know pretty much for certain what not to do, um, but it's much, much more difficult to figure out what we ought to do. It's, it's easy to recognize injustice, relatively easy compared to, say, coming up with a theory of justice that we would all agree to. That's never happened so far. And I just wonder whether there's something very, very deep um, about, I, I wonder whether that those observations suggest something rather deep about the limits of our ability to connect and to agree and to share. Um, if I think of, you know, how do I help someone? Um, uh, it's very difficult to know the answer to that. You have to know the other person very, very, very well in order to even begin to think you know what's good for them or what would what would be what it would be good for you to do in relation to them. But it's relatively easier to know what not to do, you know, what to know what would harm them if you were to do it and to just refrain from doing it. And um, <laughs> I don't know quite where I'm going with this. I guess I'm just wondering if anyone feels this the way I do. That um, uh, the, the wisdom in this, the Socratic diamond there is precisely the sense of the limits of our ability to to know others, and um, there's a sense that the respect that we have for others and that we feel is due others comes out of those limitations of our knowledge, and. Um, that seems to me very different from what I at least hear uh, Aurobindo is trying to say about the supermind, which contains perfect knowledge of everything and so on, and that we all share and that we could share and so on. And um, it struck me as very odd that he would uh, appeal to the diamond in, in the context of trying to illustrate what he meant by that. But my understanding of Aurobindo is still you know, almost non existent. <clears throat> I'd like, boy, I'd like to play off what Johnny said back to Matteo about the soul. I'll see if I can get to what you just said. Um, music. So in this chapter on the double soul, I find listening to Faure, Gabriel Faure, the French romantic composer, um, his Requiem, there, he was incredible at writing really sweet, pretty melodies, just had an incredible ability to it. If you listen to the Requiem, 
it's like it just flows with these endless, beautiful, sweet melodies and these moments where something deeper comes in. And it feels to me like the sweet melodies, sometimes it's a little bit like the sort of French overly saccharine quality. This is the, what Triabino describes as desire soul. These moments where he touches, to me, Matteo, you may remember, he talks about, you may not be in direct contact with the soul, but the, it can influence the outer nature. And we all have moments, the mother has said many times, where something, a flower, a child, a, you know, making love, whatever, can, can touch the influence of the soul. The other thing Johnny said, which strikes something, is, you know, the actor whispering, but in a way so quiet and yet can be heard in the farthest balcony. It brought to mind Yasutani Roshi was Philip Kaplow's Zen teacher. He wrote Three Pillars of Zen, and he said, anyway, um, he describes the basic Zen practice of shikintas, which is just sitting, just being, just being present, as imagine you're in the middle of a forest, and you hear, well, he says it differently, but there's a bird, this beautiful bird, way off in the distance, and your entire, Rumi says, your entire being becomes an ear, and you just, you're not, it's not a discipline, you're not like, I'm sitting here trying to meditate. It's like you, you're aspire, you want to hear that voice. And to me, meditation in the yoga is very much, but the soul is very much like that. It's like you have this sense of this, this poignant, sweet, unutterable beauty, beauty, and you just, you want to hear it. Just like you, you know, you're just drawn to it. You're not like trying to concentrate. You're drawn to it. Um, I think, I, I guess, Peter, you know, uh, I, I, Robert McDermott told me that as of 1985, Triabino had attained some score at Cambridge back in the 1890s for Greek studies that for the next 95 years, no one had gotten a higher score. So he, he knew Socrates really well. Um, my sense, what he's talking, he's talking about the psychic being, is that the psychic being in his sense, oh, later, I think one of the lines he talks about is the true conscience in us, that it doesn't know right or wrong in the mental way we normally do. It just, when you get out of the way, it's there. And it may be, I, I don't know Greek at all, but maybe Socrates was saying that when we get caught up in our minds, our mind may have to say no, 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 but the soul just knows. And, and the last thing you said in helping people I, I haven't done therapy for years, but I do evaluations and it's often with, I mean, with, with kids and adults who are like in the midst of like literally, literally life or death crises. I just did, I, I do a consult after the evaluation's over. I actually, it was a, uh, a teenage girl who has been in the psych hospital for near suicide a number of times. She's now at a group home. That she's, she and her mother desperately want to get her out of. So I thought to break the doctor-patient modality, we met at an organic food restaurant over in West Asheville, uh, with her mother and her mother's boyfriend. And I knew I couldn't go there with a plan. When I have a, a report, I'm going to explain to her, but it's like, it's like when I used to play for dance classes. I'd start my finger at the keyboard. I have no idea what I'm going to play, none. And to me, it's like, here's this music and this dance I'm going to engage in with them. And whatever happens is going to be drawn out of this field. And to me, the integral yoga is in some ways very much like that. Um, Frederick, when you were talking about sort of um, making decisions based on what we know, like sort of not to do, it reminded me of like my sort of uh, corporate life where if I go talk to the lawyers in the, in the company, <laughs> I'll get a very different conversation than if I go talk to the marketing department. <laughs> and the lawyers were telling me a lot of what not to do. <laughs> 
and um, sort of like build sort of um, ways of sort of uh, understanding the environment that are, I feel like restrictive, but informative. Um, but if I want to go be energized and <laughs> creative and do something sort of, um, you know, uh, innovative, right? That's the buzzword in our company right now and everywhere else. But um, I don't go talk to lawyers most of the time. I go talk to uh, developers or people that are sort of, you know, solving problems or, you know, uh, trying to like do something. Um, and I feel like there's like a different fl flow, uh, if I can borrow that term from Chicks and Mihai, or there's a different sort of orientation towards um, being in the moment in the way that Don's talking about, where I think usually some of the best things that I've done to be sort of some sort of instrument or um, value to another person. Like I didn't necessarily know when I was interacting with them or when it was happening that I was doing anything in particular, but there was a quality of the experience where I knew that it was somehow um, uh, deeper or more present or um, just uh, had a quality to it that I could experience, but I didn't really know per se. And I couldn't prove that it was, special or unique in some way, but I was so fully there that I could describe the, the experience in my body and in my, my senses and sort of this um, way that I would just say it was sort of like surrendered to the experience and sort of in, in that way that Chicks and Mihai talks about flow. My first experience of that was when I was a, a child or young athlete and I would have these, you know, phenomenal moments in games where I'd be like, wow, I don't know how I did that. Um, and then later on in life, I've had those moments in sort of interpersonal interactions or sort of um, uh, just moments where I felt like very intensely there. But <clears throat> I'm going to kind of pause on that and kind of jump over to this um, part of the text where he's talking about um, a quality of mind or a quality of uh, being or presence or a way that we, we experience um, what's arising or, or what's happening or, or just life uh, in a way where it's, it's not polarized or it's not sort of in this questioning mode of um, what's right or wrong. But it's, uh, he talks about this delight in the experience, like whatever the experience happens to be, um, while, while fully being conscious of the values of those experiences. And, um, at the very kind of end of this two pages, he talks about how maybe to the mind or in, in there's a way of looking at that sort of conscious consciousness or conscious awareness of all of these different ranges of experiences that we could be having. Um, and how there's an aspect of that that could be viewed as monstrous, you know, in terms of you're trying to kind of like moralize something. Um, and so that stood out for me as, is sort of, um, something that you and I have talked about in the past, but also, you know, the moral aspect of things. Um, but in this idea of sort of like, you know, I, I kind of am like being a little bit kind of pushed right now to imagine like, what is it to sort of delight in the experience while sort of like also being aware at the same time that maybe something isn't necessarily good. Um, and I think Marco kind of, maybe it was last week, I think you were talking about, well, is that super mind, you know, if, if somebody's torturing, you know, uh, an animal, you know, that's super mind. And that's kind of, I felt that stuck in my mind from the conversation last week, Marco, because I felt like you were sort of like pushing me to sort of like really think about that in an uncomfortable way. So it's like less romanticized in terms of what super mind really like implies towards this sort of ideal that I kind of hear you, Don, sort of favoring in terms of what Supermind would be. Although I kind of favor that as well in, in the sense of like, well, if you could choose, wouldn't you want to choose something that was more pleasurable for yourself and others? Um, if you were conscious, like, wouldn't you, you know, but then that's kind of contracting back to my own, like, personal values and preferences. So I, I find the idea of Supermind to be sort of, for me personally, a little bit of a dilemma when I think about what the implications are as far as that I, I can understand them. Um, so far, so. Can, can I respond to that? Um, I just want to clarify something because I think um, um, Marco, when you mentioned the cat, the crucified cat, he was responding to a story that I had told previously. Um, and it happened when I was in high school in a biology class, they had, um, they had tacked a cat onto a plywood board 
uh, in her feet and in her paws. They had nailed her to this board. She was dead and they had co coated her in formaldehyde and they had opened up her gut and there were her little embryos in her gut. So it was a biology class and the biology teacher, it still makes me shake, <laughs> I'm shaking all over. And the biology teacher was coolly and calmly talking about embryology. And all I could do was like, but the cat is dead. <laughs> you know, the cat is dead. And it was, um, and the cat, you can still see the, you know, the, the horror of this, of this cat's ang agony and also the interrupted life, the life that did not happen. Um, so I had a hard time with biology after that. It's the last thing, you know, and I, I intentionally flunked courses um, because I, that was the only way I could sort of express my um, horror. But I, as an adult, thinking about all of that and looking back on my um, sort of um, my my vulnerability, I guess, to what I thought was deliberate cruelty, I sort of understand that the persons who did that may have had good reasons and that they were, but I have a feeling that part of them was disconnected from the field. Um, and I think you can get, when we're talking about field, it, it, it can get, get very abstract because there are many different ways of using the field, but for me, or the field or the field effects, um, but for me, it's that sense of um, an area of influence. And uh, it can come and it can go, and we are, we are uh, operating uh, through many different fields, multiple fields. Um, and we know this as if you've ever performed or you've taken care of little kids or you've, you know, played an instrument or you listened to music or poetry, you know that there, there's a field activation, uh, something that um, includes you and transcends you and something in between these sort of liminal zones, these sort of trancey sort of zones that can be um, incredibly suggestive. So I, I do think it's a risk. We we can fall into the field and get lost in the field, as many people do when they get addicted to a lover or to a drug or, um, or to work or whatever. Uh, or you could get cut off from it. You can get into that hyper-rational sort of, um, you know, in invest a lot of attention into, into your map making and lose your sense of the territory. So I think it's an ever-present danger that we can go in many we could fall into the field and get lost or we can get cut off from the field. And I think those acts of, of cruelty that horrify us, I think it's some, um, you know, persons who are usually, you know, very dissociated and, and, and are obeying this sort of, um, this protective, uh, defensive, um, separate, I'm, I'm separate. And um, there's the, the subject object divide is um, maintained. So, uh, you know, I guess we're in this, um, this sort of a, this pivotal sort of point, I think, in our history. And I think uh, uh, our author, Aurobindo, was very tuned into that. And we're all probably doing the best we can with what we have. And I think he certainly did. But I found, um, you know, listening to the, the Savitri and the passages on, on death and desire, um, um, and just as uh, being able to be in that field with, with this author, I found very satisfying aesthetically. Um, that doesn't mean that um, cognitively I can't have a lot of dissonance around some of the grand statements that are, are there being made in this text. So I think there's a kind of blending that can happen. That would be my um, aspiration. Thanks. I just wanted to make one last comment because I have to go that I appreciate everyone's uh, heart energy in the circle and everyone's comments and 
uh, it's uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you all. Anyway, I every other Thursday I only have an hour and a half, so I just need to. Uh, thank, thank you, Matteo. Okay, take see you all next week. Do we lose uh Ross Frederick, it looks like, maybe. <laughs> yeah. He just texted and said he's losing connection. Is it symbolic? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I might say something to what Kim said um, about torture, torture on the supermind. Um, I think I was around six when I first was just horrified by the idea of God, that God had created this world and was like torturing all these people. And I was born about seven years after the uh, World War II ended and was very aware, coming from a Jewish background of the Holocaust, just, just God seemed horrific to me. But I think it was around 17, it was for the sort of a, a, a sudden experience of non-duality. And after that, just, I, I never could understand how people could think about evil as a problem. I mean, the torturer and the torture and the cat are all, are all of God, are all, it's all one. What, what puzzled me for six or seven years after that was Ramana Maharshi and all the non-dual people. It's like, well, wait, do we just obliterate individuality and difference then? What, what does this mean? And for me, what, what I got from Sri Aurobindo, what the supermind made sense to me, it made perfect sense to me. It had been a question, it had been an existential question for me for about seven years. Because the non-dual made total sense to me. It made absolute sense, but there was this fundamental thing missing. It seemed to take away all the meaning of, of the world, the life. Okay, it's this play, it's all one, but so what? And the sense that, yes, it's all Allah, Brahman, the divine, the Tao, and the play makes a difference. And, you know, our minds just cannot grab, but the cat's being tortured, but it's all one. But the cat's being tortured, but it's all one. And I find personally that I know I'm off track whenever I say, oh, it makes sense, I got it then I know I'm off track. Um, it seems to me that if the, uh, if the, if the conclusion of a, of a philosophical or theological system or argument or what have you is that what looks like the morally wicked torturing of a cat or a child or what have you isn't really, uh, that to me sounds more like a reductio ad absurdum of the argument. There must be something wrong with that chain of argumentation if that's the conclusion, right? we know that. I mean, if we know anything, we know that. And so I think I'm agreeing with you. In other words, um, uh, you know, if thinking that you know what the system is yields that conclusion, then clearly you don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but you know, if, the, if that's the conclusion, then it's either completely wrong uh, or you know, we're not getting it right. I can't think of any other alternative. Well, what if torture is torture? What if torture is not supermind or the will of supermind or the consciousness bliss of supermind? What if it's just torture? And it's not not the other things, but it is torture. And I think that that's part of Aurobindo's argument, but it's a bit obscured by the um, the inheritance. I think of maybe 
the modern philosophical tradition, that part of it where he posits these metaphysical entities, will, being, knowledge, consciousness, uh, as these the correlates to the traditional Hindu gods and aspects of, aspects of God. But it does... I mean, th- what he says is that in the, the triple uh, aspects of that is that it's it's all God. It's God. Everything is in God, and then God is, or Brahman is, or the supermind acts as everything. It still takes you out away from the Im- Im- the immediacy of the thing itself. If torture is torture, if a crucified cat is a crucified cat, then to say that that's really something else is to take your attention away from the actuality of what's in front of you. That's where I think that the postmodern turn thinkers like Derrida and Levinas and you know others who really questioned language, I think more deeply than question language. I'm not saying question reality or, you know, that li- philosophical movement of deconstructing the grand meta narratives and the big kind of onto theo, you know, centric concepts. I think that was very valuable because it, 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 it almost enjoins the injunction to not go there, to not go, to not avert your gaze from what's actually happening. Because that's what the you know, metaphysical systems do. So they inflate reality into something that is bigger, beyond, transcendent, etc. And then they have to find a way to reconcile it. But in the meantime, Donald Trump is president and you know, various other you know, affronts to uh, a, in, you know, a field sensitive sensibility um, uh, are occurring. Uh, and, and so I, I, I would like, I think, to like, like hone in on, tune into what was that revolutionary impulse, that revolutionary thrust to Aurobindo? Because like, I understand that he meant, to ma- he meant this to manifest in the world. He meant supermind, truth consciousness, etc., to actually transform relations. I and mean, maybe that takes 5,000 years or whatever, but what really matters is at the, my, at the, the, the present level, right? At the cellular level. Um, and I think that is a, I mean, that's where, like, say, Gebser has a different quality because you feel the crisis in him. You feel the historical crisis, I think, in him. In, in a way that um, is a bit, um, what's the word, like sublimated, uh, as wonderful as it is to sublimate, and I need to sublimate. I, I, there was one part, part in the text, and I don't know exactly where it was. It may have been in the chapter on death and dying, but where he talks about art as being the, the kind of area where we could look at the tragic and um, I could almost preserve its tragic aspect, but also hold it in a larger harmony. That's the aesthetic unity. That's the aesthetic presentation. Nietzsche, his first book was called The Birth of Tragedy. And his thesis in that book was that the ancient Greek drama was doing that. And he saw this as a sign of the health of the culture, that it could look at the most heinous, the most gruesome, the most horrific, and represent it at, in its emotional intensity, uh, but also hold it in the, 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 the wider venue of the aesthetic act, the aesthetic moment. Uh, and I think that's in Aurobindo too. I, 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 there's just so much more there that uh, um, I haven't been able to hone in on it quite. And um, 
and, and that's why I have to keep reminding myself of the context that I'm in. That I, I could go into a very spacious state of open-hearted appreciation, gratitude, and a feeling of the, the flow of life and how miraculous it all is and wonderful. And there's shit happening, right? Like shit's going down, right? And so um, that is that will impinge upon me and it already is impinging upon me and all, I think all of us in a lot of very concrete ways. And so the, the other as- aspect of Gebser is the concretization and the intensification. Like we have to match the intensity of what's really coming at us. Just like Kali moment that is breaking everything apart. Um, I find that exhilarating, but I don't want to romanticize it either. Like, I find that that gives more of a meaning to live, more of something to do, you know, like something to face, like to work with, like that, like Rilke, you know, had that line about being defeated by ever greater forces. Um, and maybe that ties in with the human aspiration and it becomes all nice in the end. But I think like there's a difference between theorizing about that and sort of, and then being like in the, in the midst of it and that imminence. Well, could I ask you, Marco, um, you mentioned Nietzsche and tragedy. Um, that, how do you relate that to Aurobindo? Because it seems to me that he does not have, he precisely doesn't have a tragic view as far as I can see for Nietzsche, for the, tra- the tragic view of Nietzsche's you know, the world is broken. It's not going to get back. You know, it's, it's not going to be unified. It's not going to be perfected. There will be tragic conflicts forever. Um, but what you can feel in response to that is that the desire to live despite the imperfect conditions under which life has been given to us is stronger than that sense of uh, rage and injustice and so on. So they seem to me to be two, not just different, but quite incompatible visions. Or am I wrong about one or the other, Nietzsche or Aravinda? Well, there is a passage in, the, in Aurobindo where, and I think it was in the text that we, it may have been that I saw it somewhere else, where he actually explains, I think, that objection in terms of the differences between Indian, Hindu metaphysical conceptions, like the, the, pan, the panoply of gods that includes the wrathful and the destructive and the violent uh, as part of the play of all of them. Whereas it, his argument in Western metaphysics and Western theology, that negative pole is dissociated from the divine. It's a fall from the divine, right? That's the, the devil and um, or pure evil, what have you. Um, I th- that is what I, but, but that, that's just a kind of very ha- haphazard skull, you know, academic uh, you know, reference. I don't want to get into the weeds, but the tragic Greek vision doesn't have anything to do with that sort of, uh, you know, Judeo-Christian fall from it was it's it was bad from the get go, <laughs> sort of built into the fabric of reality. Um, I think I that's know. why Nietzsche preferred the Greeks to the Christians. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. There might also be a reason to prefer the Christians to the Greeks, depending on your <laughs> sense of what's what the problem is. You know, as well. Anyway, this is probably getting obscure. No, no. It, so I, I thought I. would it's a general thing, and it might have some relevance to what Marco and Fred have been saying. Um, a number of people have mentioned that Shrivana retired from politics in 1910. Um, to the time of his death, the, the leaders of India, the, the Congress and the Prime Minister, were constantly coming to Pondicherry and, and talking to him, and after he died, talking to the mother. Indira Gandhi met with the mother regularly, and you know the mother probably shaped a lot of Indian policies for decades. Now, I just, we're, we're near the end. I'll get to some of the really crazy stuff, but it's going to make you think that Sri Aurobindo was a raving psychotic, raving lunatic. Um, according to Sri Aurobindo, I wish Mateo was here. He'd roll his eyes and say, Don, 
don't tell them this. Um, you know, <laughs> Sherry Bindo describes in a very calm language how he was responsible for a number of the victories in World War II, some of the in Dunkirk and D-Day and so on and so on. He put his force there. And so he was just saying he was involved very concretely. The mother describes in 1967 and 68 very specifically how the supermental force was acting around the world and the riots in France and in, in the United States and in South Africa and different places were all sort of reactions. And this, this entire trajectory from uh, Reagan through Trump is all the stirring up of, you know, the supermental, I think Mark at one point you're talking about transcendent and open-hearted, like, you know, it's the concretization of concretization. You know, she'd always said, salvation is physical. This is physical. This is about the body. It's about the earth, the body of the earth. And that, that what we're seeing is this churning of the earth. Just let you know, you know, if I was, if I, if I saw Sri Mino for a psyche valve, I have like 18 diagnoses. So what can I say? I just want to briefly mention that I appreciate that piece about the, the delight. Uh, and I'm not meaning to do a spiritual bypass on this, but just to add that piece. Um, and, and over the last year, I found Muji's teachings really helpful. But as much as anything, it's really the subtle presence of Muji. Um, and I've had experiences with Muji and online retreats and stuff where I get this feeling of bliss and it's in literally in my head area. And I had no idea that I had bliss receptors in my head <laughs> until I did retreats with Muji. So, um, you know, every each person has their own, um, and there's limitations in his teachings. And I've written to him and and to his teacher, his partner. Sorry about you know. Hey, what about Arbindo and evolution and this kind of stuff? But um, and um, that's sort of another story. But just in terms of that, that piece of the delight, there does seem to be a way that some of the, you know, the deep Indian mystical tradition, Ramana Maharshi, or whatever, they really they really got that. Um, and, and there are folks that can transmit that um, feeling. So I just wanted to share that. I heard a, a story by a musician. He, uh, I, I heard Rudolf Serkin when I was in my early 20s and Horowitz. I heard all these uh, great pianists who were you know, in their 70s and their 80s at that time. So I, uh, it was great seeing all these great musicians at the end of their lives when they were really, really good. But I heard this story by a musician, and he uh, was going to a concert with Rudolf, Rudolf Serkin, and he was in this empty auditorium, and he was up in the balcony. No one was there except for the guy who was tuning the piano, and the guy was uh, pressing um, the, the middle C, one of the keys, he was over and over and over again. And he, um, he, he was in the auditorium, he closed his eyes and he could just hear this guy hitting that key, tuning the piano for that night's performance. And then all of a sudden, as he, was, as he heard that sound, he got chills up and down his spine. And he just got this wave of ecstasy and he opened his eyes. And on the stage, instead of the piano tuner, was Rudolf Serkin the pianist who was going to play to that night. Um, and I think that's, what was the difference between the, 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 the guy who was tuning the piano and Rudolf Serkin? And um, this guy was hypothesizing, he was a, he was a musician. He said he, had, he thinks it had something to do with the intention, um, that Serkin had a, an intention. And I believe that um, those... I think these field effects are actually very ordinary. We can have extraordinary experiences and transmissions from, um, you know, spiritual masters or from great poets or great literature, or certainly music, um, children, you know, a squirrel or a bird. I mean, I mean, we're just surrounded by all these opportunities to be 
thrilled out of our minds. <clears throat> so I, I um, you know, and yet we have to work with the, the dark side. Um, we have to work with um, the murder and the rape and um, the misuse of power. And, you know, I just, I just killed a mosquito just now, you know, came into my room and landed on my arm and I killed it without, <laughs> without a second thought about it because I knew it would keep me up all night if I didn't kill it. So, you know, we, we, and I had chicken tonight for dinner. So, I mean, we're all having to, to kill and make ends meet the best way we can. And we're living in a, in a system that seems to uh, be out of uh, run amok right now. So anyway, we're doing the best. I, I, I'm sure we're doing the best we can. And we're all sharing this uh, text together. So I'm sure that has a lot to do with why we're reading this. That was middle C for you. Oh, it didn't give me any chills, Don. Sorry. It's almost two hours, so you have a sense of how we might close it, or or people wanting to stay longer. Or I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off at seven anyway. I'm going to a reunion tomorrow with. Um some old friends, folks I did volunteer work with like 20 years ago. I haven't seen in a long time. We're going Granby, Colorado, somewhere in the mountains. I've never been there before. Some hot springs and stuff. So we'll get our super mind on uh, there. And um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I don't know what's next. Um. I want to create something. That's really what I want to do. You know, I want something to come of my particular efforts, you know, all of our, of our efforts. I think that there's a kind of disarray. Um, some people are focused, you know, people running for office, some great primaries, you know, interesting candidates, things like that. Like Don mentioned, there's all, everybody, look, there's beautiful things happening on that social level, the social political level. Um, you know, the odd seem... Uh, you know, unfavorable in some ways, but in other ways, it's like, it's, it's the, it's force. Right. And um, I think the singularity is, is something to do with um, like finding your particular way of instantiating like that next, that next phase you know, like the mutation that the way Gabeser described mutation, that was a really useful contribution, I think. Mutation versus evolution, this something different emerges. A mutation is all, a lot of times imperfect. And I think that's why it's a, it's a great concept. Because it doesn't suggest an orderly, you know, like progression of... of of events, it it, it happens dis, in discontinuous and chaotic ways. But the aggregate effect of many mutations that you know, some the, is is transformation. Like we don't have to wait five thousand years to mutate. Like if it's gonna if it is happening through us, it just happened now. Um, I mean, what does that mean practically? I'm going to go see people I love and um, 
maybe the last time I see them, really. I haven't seen them in 20 years. And so, like, I, I kind of think about it in terms of, like, what's passing, what's transient. My family, like, this, this lifetime, right? I mean, it's a blip kind of in the super mind, in the super mind's whole play. Uh, but it's my blip. And then it's not. I don't mean to be like self-centered, but I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, if that's one of the maybe um, potential implications of this, like if Supermind decides to become an individual, why go around pretending that you're Supermind? Why not just be the individual you are? Wouldn't that be kind of what Supermind is doing? So I'm like, with respect to like art, right? And because that's what you're doing. You're, you're emphasizing difference. You're emphasizing like the, the not yet, the unknown, the, the more than, the non-reducible. Um, I think that the singularity has something to do with that as well. And it's, hap- it's this fractal thing because it can happen as you, in you, through you, without reduction or even or, or amplification or you know, trans, transposing that into some other being. Um, but then it also happens, I think, at the cosmic and universal level. And like, that's maybe where we can intellectualize it a bit more and not get self-centered about it. Because you're like, well, yeah, it feels like I'm the supermind or I'm the, I am that. But uh, look around. Like, it's not, it's, it's, uh, um, it's everything. So it's not other than than anything else whatever Uh, thank you i don't want to i knew i was going to ramble i knew it yeah but it felt it felt great to hear it was 100 degrees today and so i'm sort of just steeping in (laughs) sweating well had a nice feel to it marco whatever you said for for a moment there i thought i was in catholic church because you were talking about through him with him and him (laughs) in the unity of the holy spirit i'm like wait come back (laughs) and then i jumped over to gebser and i came back so yeah i've been writing and so it puts me in a sort of state because i I kind of you know i'm like performing it's like john it that's a very useful too outlook the performer's outlook i think um and that it ties into what we were talking about at the very end of the last call when Terry was here and she was talking about the text as being these actors, these kind of performers. And, and then uh, Flo's dream where the character in his, in his dream all be, you know, they were attacking him, trying to invade. It's like, and then they said, well, we're just acting. And so are you. And I had a dream last night where like, I was trapped in somebody's house and in some kind of like predatory relationship. Uh, and I think I, it was something I picked up from somebody else, but it came into my dream. And, um, and it was important in the dream to like manifest force and to define like boundary and to sort of zap, like zap the, the, the you know, the people around me that were um, almost kind of, tr- you know, trying to, trap me bye Derwin so anyway that's that's uh what's up with me uh and hey Marco can I can I just interrupt here like you were talking about having a dream about a house um being stuck in a house and I had this dream last night where I was invited into a house by sort of a a character that's a familiar personality here in Dallas um, who's, uh, I, I want to be vague since this is re- being recorded, <laughs> but, um, let's just say this person has their hands in a lot of different things that would be well known. And in the dream, I was like being welcomed in the house and it was a hug, you know, and then they, they were like in this sort of like teaching position, sort of like there was a bunch of mats around, but it was weird because it felt like I was back in, I forget whose house it was back in Boulder, back in the integral days. But um, I remember I went to a house where a bunch of people were like, you know, sharing a space and it felt like that house 
but with this sort of like Dallas bigger than life sort of character and then with uh, one of my other friends and we were sort of like receiving like teaching or darshan from this person but it was sort of ridiculous because we were like actually trying to work together to like create this thing together but because of this person's like relative sort of financial means they had a position of sort of like relative perceived sort of authority and it was like kind of like ridiculous to me but like they knew that they were sort of like playing that sort of role but like we were all sort of like co sort of like you know uh, like co-creating or like sort of contributing in our own unique ways to what was like trying to arise. What was interesting to me about it was that there was three people in the dream, but there's all the, these other mats in these spaces where people were like, you know, like waiting to like come in and sit down. And uh, it was really weird, but it was just, I told my friend about it today, but I like had this sense of like, there was something special about that dream. Uh, just kind of, I don't know, because it's, because of this bigger than life character, I met one of the other people in the dream, you know, and it was like this sort of like, we're trying to like do this thing, but sometimes the roles that we're sort of like in, we miss the fact that we're all contributing like in the same sort of, in the, you know, in the same way, but like in different, um, very unique positions or roles or identities or sort of personal narratives and, and where we're sort of contributing. And sometimes I think right now, at least was so much noise in the political sort of realm and a lot of uncertainty and a lot of stress, quite frankly, in my job, in my corporate job, a lot of uncertainty in the technology world. Um, I think it's really easy to miss all of the sort of really unique ways in which individuals in, in groups are actually sort of coming together and doing interesting things. And that many times when there is that kind of leap or this sort of interesting thing that happens or an interesting discovery, it's because of a lot of other things that are happening at the same time that you wouldn't necessarily be able to put together. But that causes that um, mutation. But, you know, there's also this idea of a collective mutation like the Internet and some other things that, you know, how irritating was the Internet for the Chinese government, right? <laughs> or like how irritating was, uh, um, and I go back to, I'll never forget, and then I'll be quiet. Um, when I was living in China was the year that Obama and Secretary Clinton and all this stuff was going on with the Chinese blocking the the internet and attacking Google and all this stuff. And I'll never forget that uh, Hillary Clinton used to describe um, the internet as a nervous system for the planet, you know, and like that idea and like what what are the contributions to technology. Um, and, and again, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of hopeful without being sort of like naive or whatever, but I think there's a lot of interesting things going on that we can't quite sort of, you know, perceive quite yet. And that's my sort of sense anyways. And part of it is just to remain a sort of sensitivity and an openness to people that are sort of, you know, finding a language for this or finding their expression of it, I think, uh, in the way that you're kind of describing. It's like, what's the unique expression where this is sort of like bubbling up in people and recognizing that and encouraging that in whatever way that it's sort of appearing for that person, but having a kind of an aesthetic or feeling for where that's trying to come up and encouraging it. China loves the internet now. It's like the perfect tool. <laughs> you know? but, <laughs> Love, uh, hate. Yeah, it's a little noisy right now, signal noise, that whole problem. But, you know, I mean, just all the technologies too, like, you know, with what Tesla's doing and sort of some of these, um, like these trends right now we're seeing in manufacturing, at least, you know, I work for Siemens and we're seeing these trends in manufacturing where on a superficial level, okay, I can get any kind of sneakers or dress that I want to match the color of the, you know, seams of my car, right? Because I can order it all and get it printed very really quickly. But, you know, really, if you think about agile manufacturing and the implication of that for, for us as human beings, like there's some really interesting sort of things that could be made. Like you could fabricate homes and crises and you could like have these distributed sort of manufacturing facilities that are a little bit more flexible, not so like top down. And so I, I think, you know, this whole model is shifting to decentralization and all of that. And a lot of different areas we're seeing in energy. Um, so I'm, I'm more just sort of curious. I think we're in a really painful period. I think Ken Wilber said we're sort of in a regressive state right now. But um, and, you know, like you said, it might be 500 year arc, you know, to move forward. But I don't feel I like I don't feel 
you know, I don't feel like I have to solve the problem, but I feel, I feel like a curiosity about how we're, how we're meeting this challenge. And I see totally tons of inspiration from people in my social world or my community in terms of social justice and finding their voice. And like Trump has like really inspired a lot of people I knew that were like really meek and mild to be like, fuck this, you know, I'm going to go sort of try and articulate my, my values or what's important or what I think is a better way of doing this. And so there's been an odd reaction to him that I think has caused a lot of people that were comfortable to in complacent to, to charge forward. And I can't say that I've personally found like my absolute sort of clear avenue towards how I want to like fully express that. But I certainly feel energized by it in the way that I kind of maybe hear you describing. And I'm like, damn it, what's my thing? You know, like, what is it? I want to know what it is. <laughs> And I guess I say I take some comfort in not being entirely sure of that, um, but feeling the energy of you talking got me excited. So now I'm rambling. So thank you. <laughs> I came across for the first time because I'm not a very political fella nor historical, but the the banner or poster that John Lennon and Yoko Ono put up, "The War Is Over," and then a little small script. There's if you want it to be, and I think it was in reference to the Vietnam War, which it sounded like at the time I wasn't there, but it sounded like pretty much everybody would like for that war to be over. But how do you end it? And it's the same thing with governments or the state rules, lawyers, all this, this no, 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 that um, comes up in front of our faces. And there, how do we stop it? And it, it seems so simple. It seems like we could just say, well, um, plastic is over if you want it to be, or morals are over if you want it to be. Um, there's, there's so much we're capable of and the internet is definitely expounding that, but there's also each individual with their own personal view. And I, I really like my own personal view. It, it works for me. <laughs> I wish it could work for everybody and then the world would be a better place. But, um, <laughs> but that's right. What, what, what do we need to be over at this point? Like we can say politics is over. And how <laughs> that's, that might be the question right now for me. Hard parts following through like on that intent. Yeah. I guess that's a revolutionary idea, but revolutions tend to stop once they're started. Yeah. Before I start rambling, I should say good night. Mm -hmm. yeah. Blessings to all of you. I've had a, it's a, been a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Sweet dreams, wow. everybody. <laughs> should we call that a night for everyone? Yeah, Anybody let's uh, unmute. Anybody else want to speak up maybe? Mass unmute. Good night, John. Thank you, Marco. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Nice thank to meet you. you, Susan. Good night, and thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Good morning. Good night. Thanks, thanks Fred, too. I really appreciated <laughs> yeah. your, thank uh, you all. I appreciated your, uh, your, uh, your questions and insights there. Fred, I was talking to you. The, oh. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I, I liked your points. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I like yours, too. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Aww. Everyone else is free. It's a budding bromance, all right. <laughs> so, uh, Good night. Bye, night. guys. Bye, Don. Night. Bye, Don.